Well, good morning. We continue through our study of Acts. We come to the 18th chapter of Acts. Remember, this is the Acts of the Apostles and um, really underlays all of the epistles that are written uh, to the churches, especially from Paul. And here in chapter 18, uh, we're going to see how uh, this gives us a brief history of uh, Corinth, and we'll look at that. And then, uh, of course, in 19, Ephesus, and uh, the length of time Paul spent in Ephesus. So let's pray before we begin. Lord, uh, we pray you grant us the presence of the Holy Spirit to, for understanding and insight into your word, that we may understand it, uh, that we may live it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we begin in, in chapter uh, 18, and remember Paul in 17, Paul was in Athens, and uh, which was the intellectual center of the world. It was Greek, uh, and it was the culture, information, uh, learning, and they were very prideful in that as well. And Paul now leaves Athens, and he goes to Corinth. And if Athens was the city of learning, Corinth is the city of sin. And we've looked at this many times over the years about uh, the, the practices at Corinth, uh, the worship of the Temple of Aphrodite, and, and, and we'll, we'll review that briefly in just a moment. Um, but it, it, it's not that the people at Corinth weren't learned uh, and were just sinful. They, they were learned as well, but not quite in the same way as they were in Athens. But they really had sin down to what we might say an art in Corinth. Um, it was uh, the most, uh, for the period of time, the most debauched and debased city uh, in the known world. Um, in fact, the, the name Corinth became synonymous with immorality. Uh, so, verse, uh, verse 1, and after this, uh, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew there named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now, this was part of the, the purge that Claudius had um, in, in the city of Rome to get the Jews out. Uh, they were... Uh, under persecution, and he just kind of cleaned house, so to speak, uh, to remove all the Jews from Rome. Um, so Paul is going to Corinth, as, as we'll see, and we'll, we'll cover Aquila and Priscilla uh, a, a little bit later. And Paul's going to Corinth, and he's a little bit fearful here because he actually says, in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. Um, not everything had gone so well in Macedonia, even though the Lord had called him to go there. But the Lord doesn't promise us that everything will go well. He just promised us uh, that when we follow him and do what he says, that, that uh, we will be within his will. And again, chapter 18 really summarizes this visit to Corinth. And Corinth is composed uh, of a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles. Um, Verse 4, and he reasoned, that would be Paul, in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So it's a, a mixed bag there. Predominantly uh, Gentile, since while Paul is here, um, uh, there's a real defining moment in his uh, ministry, as he says in verse 6, um, when they opposed and reviled him, that would be the Jews, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So Paul really becomes uh, the apostle to the Gentiles from now on. Now he still uses the synagogue as a, as a, as a means to present the gospel, uh, but he is really focused upon the Gentiles. Um, so Paul is here about 18 months, as we see this throughout uh, the chapter uh, 18. And he really had no desire, as we can understand, to make this the base of operations. He kind of wanted to go back to the church at Thessalonica, and we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, but according to what the Lord wants, his plans had changed. Verse 9, and the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you. To harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months 
Now, this is the guy who was a little fearful coming into Corinth. And the Lord says, I'm going to protect you here. There are plenty here who will respond to the gospel who are God's own children. And for 18 months, Paul was there planting the church in Corinth. So let's look just a little bit about Corinth in general. Uh, it's on a plateau. It overlooks the isthmus of uh, the connection between Greece and uh, Peloponnesus. And Corinth was uh, one of the main cities politically and economically in Achaia. And it's situated on this little isthmus. It's three and a half miles wide. And on one side, uh, you have the Saronic Gulf and the Aegean Sea. And on the other side, you have the uh, Gulf of Corinth and the Adriatic. And Corinth was called the Bridge of Greece. Now, it was both north and south a means of trade. And that would be the land trade that went north and south. And then east and west uh, was the sea trade. And you think, well, if how did the sea, how did it get, how did they do that? Well, what they did is they had about a three and a half mile um, uh, space there where they would take the boats from one side, put them on rollers, and roll them across the isthmus for three and a half miles on these wooden rollers, and, and that saved them uh, quite a lot of time rather than sailing all around. Um, so the Corinth re reached its peak uh, between the 6th and 7th century uh, BC, and it, in 196, it was captured by the Romans. The Romans declared it a free city. In 146, it was destroyed. Most of the inhabitants were killed, were taken off in slavery by Lucius Mummus. And for 100 years, it lay in ruin until Julius Caesar, in about 44 BC, decided uh, to rebuild the city. And it was repopulated with um, retired conscripts from the army, which the Romans did on a regular basis. And the new Corinth uh, became pretty debauched pretty quickly. And in fact, the Greek verb to fornicate is Corinthiazomaya. Okay, so it was the word Corinth, what meant to sin. So apparently in this estimation, um, there were a thousand prostitutes that, that worshipped or helped you worship at the temple of Aphrodite, uh, which was on a, about an 1,800 feet uh, plateau above uh, the main city. And uh, the population at this time is about 200,000. So it's very metropolitan, uh, very debauched, very busy, uh, very wealthy because of the trade. And it is into this culture that the gospel comes. And the gospel is really the antithesis of what this culture is all about. Um, it, 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 promotes, uh, it promotes women, it promotes marriage, it promotes fidelity, uh, it promotes one God instead of many. And so it's very radical as it comes into Corinth. Uh, Corinth was also the place for the Isthmus Games, which took place every two years. They were kind of the, the off-season of the Olympic Games. And because of the, a lot of the uh, Greek uh, influence uh, in that area, um, they, they, they ran, they wrestled, they did uh, the, through the javelin. And, and the Greeks all did this uh, without any clothes on. Uh, the Romans thought that was crazy and didn't really like that. But at the Isthmus Games, that's how they competed. And we see Paul tie into that competition uh, the athletic competition a little bit in, in his first letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 9 where he says, um, I, I, don't you know that I, I race as, as to compete but only one person wins the race. I box, uh, buffeting my body. Um, uh, I discipline my body. He's using all of these athletic uh, references uh, so that the people of Corinth would understand those. Those would be culturally relevant for them. So let's go back a little bit uh, to, to verse 3. Uh, and because he was of the same trade, uh, he stayed with them and worked with them, for they were tent makers. That's his Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul, as we use the phrase today, tent maker, he had a profession beyond his theological profession, and uh, as young men went through uh, the Jewish schools, the rabbinical schools, uh, to, to, to be scholars, they were obligated to learn a trade as well. 
in case they couldn't make any money in their scholarship. Uh, and Paul's trade was tent making. Um, so Paul reasoned, uh, verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Jews and, and we say God-fearing Greeks, Greeks who are looking for spiritual things and they come to the synagogue uh, to hear and he persuades them about Jesus Christ. And he's anxious about these new believers. He's got spiritual concerns. He's got uh, constant opposition. He really wants to get back to Thessalonica uh, and, and see those people. But as we saw a little bit earlier, the Lord says 18 months here at Corinth. And Paul is lacking funds here. That's one of the reasons he does the tent making ministry. Uh, that is until his friends show up, Silas and Timothy, with a gift from the church at Philippi. And we've seen uh, that was his favorite church before and they loved Paul and they've given him a gift which is going to enable him to do ministry full time and not have to be a tent maker here. So what happens when the gospel comes and Paul delivers it, um, it's the same thing. Uh, some believe and some don't. And those who don't believe just start to make trouble for Paul. Uh, we've got these non-believing Jews uh, who really opposed him in verse 6. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. Uh, from now on I will go to the Gentiles. Now there's an obligation uh, that we see in the Old Testament if someone is in sin and, and you need to tell them. Uh, and if you tell them and they don't repent, then their blood is on their hands and you are innocent of it. But if you see them in their sin and don't tell them, uh, then you bear some responsibility as well because you didn't intervene in their lives and help them get on the right track. So many believed, uh, many did not, uh, many opposed the gospel, uh, and in fact some resolved that, that they would go to great lengths to make sure that nobody else believed the gospel. Uh, and in fact it says uh, they had delivered his soul, and, and what that means in, in, uh, um, in, in linguistically is that they had committed their entire beings and souls to oppose what Paul was saying. And when the, Paul says, your blood be on your own heads, you will be your own destroyers. Uh, you are responsible for yourself, and because you are pursuing this path, you are destroying yourself. And Paul was, in a, to some degree, hoping that this phrase, your blood be on your own heads, would be a wake-up call, would be shocking enough, because he was quoting from the Old Testament, uh, would be shocking enough for them to uh, get out of their um, stubbornness and selfishness, but for most it was not there. So we continue in verse 8, Crispus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, believed the Lord along with his entire household. Now this is really shocking that the, the leader of the synagogue would come to Christ because of Paul's preaching. Um, this would be uh, the equivalent today would be uh, if, if, um, if uh, an evangelical Christian uh, went to a mosque and, and preached the gospel and the head of the mosque uh, believed in Jesus Christ, became a Christian. Uh, it was really shocking and Crispus would, uh, uh, it would be tough on him and his family as well. Uh, so here you have Paul preaching, some believe, some don't, the Jews, grew, the Jews grew jealous, they stirred up opposition, Paul flees for his life. Um, so, you know, this is just the way that Paul's life was at this time. Um, so Paul is discouraged, he's uh, somewhat afraid, and that's when the Lord tells him, don't be afraid, you're going to be here for 18 months. Uh, so Paul uh, will return later to Corinth on his third missionary journey, and that's probably where he writes the letter to the church at Rome while he's at Corinth. And in Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11, there's that great section where Paul gives a, a discourse on uh, the question, 
uh, has God abandoned the Jews completely? Has he abandoned his covenant people completely? And he kind of compares, uh, he's making the comparison between um, uh, Israel and the church and what does that mean? And, and that's a whole other uh, issue to discuss. But uh, keep in mind that the Lord will not abandon his people and all those who are his will come to him and will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And that includes uh, whatever portion of the, the, the Jews of Israel that the Lord has called and drawn unto himself. Um, so Paul receives a vision and confirms these things with, uh, with these events here in verses 12 and following. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth and defend himself, because Paul was, was bold and was not, not shy about defending himself, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or a vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourself. I, I refuse to be a judge in the midst of this. Um, so Gallio says, uh, no, uh, uh, this, is, this is kind of an in-house issue for you, you Jews. You handle this, uh, and it's an internal matter. Now, Gallio was a, uh, the son of Marcus Annius Seneca, who was a Spanish rhetorician, who was the brother of Seneca, the well-known Stoic philosopher uh, that, that many today still uh, pay attention to. So the Jews brought Paul before them on this charge of breaking the Roman law, and Gallio says, uh, you guys deal with it, that's your business. Okay? And uh, to some degree, in the dismissing of these charges, gave Christianity um, validity within society. Uh, which it held for probably in the Corinthian society another 10 or 15 years um, before the, the, the real persecution from the Roman Empire crept up once again. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then um, 16, and he drove them from the tribunal and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Now, the question is, why would they attack Sosthenes, the new leader of the synagogue, because Crispus had become a believer. Now, could it be possible that Sosthenes had become a believer too? Would that be fabulous if um, he, replaced Gal he replaced Crispus, who became a Christian, and while he's the leader of the synagogue, he becomes a Christian too? Uh, there's some thought that Sosthenes uh, was Paul's uh, amanuensis, his secretary. Now, we don't have proof of this, but there we can kind of look and see 1 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1, uh, may hint at that, that this is the same guy. <clears throat> so let's, let's continue verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Now notice the order is changed here. And um, originally it was Aquila and Priscilla. Um, perhaps in, in, the, in uh, verse 2 it's a little bit more formal. Here it's a little bit more informal. Maybe Priscilla had better gifts than Aquila. It, we really don't know. We talk a lot a bit about that, but... They were a couple who were doing ministry, and we'll see in particular they're ministering with Apollos. Uh, at at uh, Cantrea, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. And this is Paul. Now, this vow is a Nazarite vow. And you took a Nazarite vow unto the Lord, usually for a period of time. But some people were Nazarites from birth. They, they were devoted by their parents uh, by uh, to to the Lord under a Nazarite vow. Samson would be an example of this. And things that you could not do, you could not drink strong drink, you could not touch anything from the vine, um, you couldn't cut your hair here as an example. And that's what is referring to. Sometimes uh, in this, uh, the short-term Nazarite vows were 
public, obviously, because if you weren't cutting your hair, that was going to be seen by everybody. Uh, and it was uh, to devote yourself unto the Lord for a period of time. And when the vow finished, you usually, if you were in Jerusalem, were close enough, you, then you went to Jerusalem, you made a sacrifice, and it was usually a lamb, uh, something of, of value, and you cut your hair, and the hair would be burned as part of the sacrifice unto the Lord. Uh, but when everybody saw that you were under that vow, you were really, uh, it, that's what made it so public, and you couldn't break that uh, peer pressure from the public, but it was a vow unto the Lord, and they were very particular about keeping that vow, and that really comes out of Numbers chapter 6, uh, where Moses talks about it. So, um, verse 19, and they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now, of course, that's the 18 months he spent at Corinth, now he's, he's in Ephesus. <clears throat> Um, and they came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he sets sail for Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia, Phrygia, strengthening all uh, the the disciples. Now, Paul has just traveled about 1,200 miles in those verses. And obviously, uh, what went on there beyond the vow and the strengthening of the churches is not really theologically important or it's covered in other places. But Luke just gives us a summary of that 1,300-mile journey uh, in just a few verses there. And now we come across, in the rest of the chapter, this young man named Apollos and his interaction with Priscilla and Aquila. Verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. So Apollos uh, has, uh, uh, knows to some degree uh, what the scripture says. And, and the graphia, that's the word used by scripture, means Old Testament scriptures. That's what he's talking about here. He was competent in the Old Testament scriptures. And he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. So as far as he was concerned, his understanding of Jesus ceased with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is saying that you know Jesus is coming, of course, this is uh, 10, 10 to 15 years after that. So he's kind of uh, uh, doesn't really know the whole story about Jesus. And he's lacking something uh, as well as we'll see in just a moment. Uh, he began to speak boldly in a synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, this is one of those explaining. They didn't admonish him, but they lovingly took him aside and said, let me fill in the gaps in your knowledge about who Jesus Christ is. Let me bring you up to speed. Uh, you've got lots of gifts, which were clearly evident, but you're lacking a certain amount of knowledge. So the, the words that they use here, katekeo, uh, is where we get the word catechize from. So as they taught him the scriptures, they were catechizing him. And a catechism, uh, being Presbyterians, we understand the Westminster uh, Confession and the Westminster Catechisms, both the large and the, the longer and the shorter catechism. Uh, and they are a way of learning scripture and theology through questions and answers. And that's what they did here. This is not... Uh, inspired knowledge. They, they, this doesn't come right from the Lord like Paul when he's taught in the desert or the apostles, but this is information that is instructed or taught. And when he wished to cross Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed and he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the, the Christ was Jesus. So one of the things that he is missing here, 
um, as far as understanding about who Christ is, is also the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, so when they bring him up to speed, when they explain the way of God more accurately, that's one of the things that is um, uh, explained to him. And we can see that in, in different places where Paul has been, as we've seen earlier, that the gospel has come, but they had not heard about the Holy Spirit. And the, then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So we can imagine uh, the power, of how he powerfully refuted the Jews in public once he had a fuller knowledge of Christ and, of course, the presence of the Holy Spirit as well. Now, did he become a believer now? Well, that's possible that he wasn't a believer before and he just knew about Jesus' coming. He was looking forward to that. And maybe in that fulfillment, he actually becomes a believer. Now, there is some uh, uh, thought that Apollos, because he is a native of Alexandria and was a Jew, um, he kind of fits the, the mold uh, of what we see written in the, the, the book of Hebrews. So there, there's some speculation that he, maybe he was the author of Hebrews. There's no guarantee that anybody except the Lord knows who uh, wrote the book of Hebrews. But he kind of fits that mold. Uh, and he is, uh, he is sharp. Uh, he is used by the Lord. Um, and he could have done that. But again, we don't know for sure. And it's interesting, just uh, as an aside, that he was explained the way of God more accurately. Um, we see Paul, even after 25 years of after becoming a believer, he talks about it in, in the epistle of Philippians, not that I have already obtained it or that I have become perfect, but I press on so that I can lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of Christ Jesus, by Christ Jesus. So Paul says, I'm still learning, I'm still growing. Uh, I'm still understanding what Christianity means and what the work of Christ means in my life and how I am to communicate that. And that's a lesson for every believer today. Uh, you never uh, get there. You don't get there till you leave this world and stand before the throne of grace. Then you're there. Uh, until then, you are commanded uh, and expected to grow in the Lord on a regular basis. Uh, and hopefully you can look back in your life 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, of Christian life and see how you've grown, see how you have matured and understood more and applied it more. Um, if if you, you're stuck at third grade Sunday school with David and, and uh, Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den, then, then you better, better get on the stick and dig into the word because Paul says we press on towards the upward call of Christ. So we'll stop there and look at Paul in Ephesus next week in chapter 19.